Hi, I'm Kelly with Cobblecraft, K-A-0-K-A-O, and it's story time. We talked last time in the intro about uh, starting a little bit of a series here in Navi, which is a section of Tanakh, uh, the Hebrew Bible, and it's the portion that in our English Bibles we would call 1 Samuel. And this story is going to unfold to show us some things about what it means to be a king in God's eyes. And I think as the story unfolds, you'll get a picture of how much different it is than what we see in our world today. So I hope you'll join me on this little exploration. Uh, if you'll remember, we told you that the story starts out, Vayahi Ish Echad, and I'm going to share that first three words in Hebrew just because I want you to feel how foreign this is. It's not because I'm any great scholar in it, I'll tell you that. I've just been studying this for 40 years and don't have any official training, but I can see the story and I appreciate the story, so I hope you'll dive with me into it. What does this mean? It means there was this one guy, and we explored that in the intro a little bit. This one guy is Elkanah. And he's not even that big of a player in this story. What's going to happen is that uh, he'll have a kid. That kid will be a bigger part in the story. And then along will come some kings, and we'll get to know these guys. But it's important first that we know a little bit about Elkanah. So it tells us in the text that he was from Ramathayim Zophim, which, oh yeah, where's that, you know? Uh, later in the story, they'll simplify it to call it Rama. But uh, it's in the hill country of Ephraim. So already, I like this guy. You know, I'm kind of a country boy, and my kin are from Arkansas, the hill country there. And so I can appreciate these. These were kind of the backwoods of Israel in the day, and the, the hill country and all. It wasn't far from uh, some of the other poignant places that'll turn up as we move forward. Uh, it tells us that Elkanah was the son of so-and-so who was the son of so-and-so, who was the son of so-and-so. And that's where a lot of people, when they start reading the Bible, they're not really appreciating the story. They're maybe kind of getting into the details, and they're like, oh, man, who are all these people? I don't know. And maybe it's not all that critical, but it's important to the story if we realize that Elkanah has this son. What did he do in the big picture? Maybe not much. But he was a righteous man, and he lived in such a way that when he raised up this kid, this kid is going to really shake the world. So we'll see that happening. What about Elkanah and this being the son of so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so? And so and so? It helps us to understand that he was from a particular tribe in Israel. Now, the strange thing that we might think, it tells us in the text that this guy was uh, an Ephratite. So you might think, oh, well, he's from the tribe of Ephraim. Well, actually, no. He's an Ephratite, like I'm an Iowan. Uh, I'm <laughs> kind of supplanted over the generations from Arkansas and before that Georgia and before that, I don't know, somewhere else, probably somewhere in Europe, we've moved along and ended up here in Dubuque, Iowa. But Elkanah is in Rama. And how did he get here? Well, it turns out that if you look at the father of the father of the father of the father, you end up going back to a guy who was the son of Jacob, Yaakov, who is actually the tribe, this Levi, or you pronounce it Levi in Hebrew. This guy was the one that would later on become the uh, priestly tribe. So he's a, a Levi, actually, when you look at all the genealogy of where he came from. But the Levites didn't have any land of their own. They were not given a portion of land like all the other uh, tribes were. They had to live among the people because they needed these Levites, these priestly people to help them understand how to serve God and stuff. So he was a Levite, but he's living in the land of Ephraim, the land that God had set apart for them. So that's just a little bit of a tidbit to help us figure out where he is. As an Iowan, story is an important part of our lives. I'm a hunter. I enjoy hunting. And we have some of the biggest whitetail in the nation here, and people come from all over to uh, enjoy hunting these creatures. But half the fun of the hunting is the telling of the story. And you'll find as we go through these deer stories 
that uh, it may meander a little bit. You know, it's not just, well, I shot this deer 150 yards with blah, blah, rifle. No, it's not like that. It's like, well, you know, there's a background to everything. And we started out at this particular farm and we moved to that particular timber and so-and-so was with me. And, and as the story builds and you find out what rifle's being used, you find out, oh man, that thing kicks like a mule and all this other stuff. So it may meander a little bit as we're going. And that's part of what we're seeing here as we learn about the hill country of Ephraim. You're going to also find out, if you read the text yourself, which is cool, help you appreciate the bigger picture of this story. There's a lot of details there. But as we look at the story itself, there's a situation that Elkanah has to deal with. So he's got two wives. Any of us who are married know that it's, it's a little stressful sometimes just having one wife. Love you, though. Um, in particular, his first wife, his favorite wife, is a gal named Hana, and she uh, has a problem in her life. She doesn't have any kids. That's a big deal in their culture. His second wife is Penina, and she has all kinds of kids, and that's going to become a, a difficulty in the story as we move forward. But before we get to there, let's understand a little bit about this guy, this guy of the priestly lineage. He would leave his town up in the hill country and he would go down uh, to Shiloh, which is where the Tent of Meeting was set up. And he would do this regularly. In the text it says every year, but actually in Hebrew I don't think that's a really good translation. It's more like uh, kind of from season to season. There were at least three times a year that you had to go to uh, make appropriate um, feasts and stuff. And that's part of the picture we need to see about what's going on at Shiloh. So uh, that'll unfold as we get to meet these two wives a little bit. But the important thing here is that we really want to see about Elkanah and how he uh, lived his life. He was going to Shiloh, to the tent of meeting, to worship. Now it says there he was going to sacrifice. And we think, oh, you know, this is just like uh, this strange stuff that they were doing back in those days. They'd kill an animal and they'd put it on the fire and all this stuff. But there's way bigger picture to it. And a bigger part of that to Elkanah was to worship. And how in the world does that play into slaughtering an animal and putting it on the fire, things like this. Um, we'll also find out that when he goes there, there's these two characters. One is named Hafni and the other Pinchas. And these are the two sons of Eli, the high priest. So those names are going to be kind of critical for the first few chapters as we move through here. These guys are priests, which uh, I shouldn't even call them that. I should call them Kohanim because that's the Hebrew term for them. And we need to keep our minds realizing that this is all foreign stuff to us. That we think of a priest and we might picture a guy in black robes with a little white collar or something like this. or. Um, yeah, we, we have our own ideas of what things are, and we want to make sure we're picturing things through the Eastern culture that makes up uh, the Bible. It's important for us to see that. So let's take a little dive in here and realize. So let's, there's one of these particular stories where Elkanah takes his two wives, Hana and Pinah, Penina, and they go down to Shiloh. They're going down their hill and here's Shiloh is the Hebrew way of saying it and they're going to worship. So how does this happen? Yeah he takes a sacrifice depending on which feast it is there's certain sacrifices and whatnot but he would uh, slaughter the animal or he would have the other priest do it. It depends on the situation. I don't know how priestly he was or if he was just a Levite. That's not even part of the story really. It's just this was happening. They'd have a ritual slaughter and the important thing and this is what people often miss when they're reading through the scripture is that the most important part of doing these sacrifices had very little to do with shedding the blood had very little to do with putting the animal on the altar what it had to do with was they would gather their family and friends if you had a big bull you were sacrificing good night you can't just throw that in the freezer or put it up in salt or whatever you would not have enough uh, um, 
time to eat all of that thing. So you'd gather as many friends and family as you could to help you eat that. You had like two days to eat the thing, and you had to share it with the priests that helped you too. So, you know, there's that going on, and we'll see a little story off to the side of that too with Pinchas and Hafne. So, um, as we do that, let's see here. Imagine this little feast with Hana and Penina, and what do we have going on? Elkanah brings the portions of whatever it was that he sacrificed, and he's delighted to share that with them. That may seem strange to our eyes, that, oh, what in the world, why is that a big deal? But there's details about this as you read the Torah that uh, will tell you exactly, you know, you, you've got to do this and this, and if you're too far away that you can't drag all this stuff with you, you can turn it into money and buy this stuff when you get there, uh, whatever. So imagine that Elkanah is now making this feast, and he's given the portions to his wife. So he gives a single portion to Kana, and it breaks his heart because she's childless. He gives her just one portion, and it's kind of hard to pick up in English. Some of the translations even say he gives her a double portion, but that's not how you really read it in Hebrew. You could argue over it, but... The, the word that he uses for double is the nostrils. There's two of them. And you could as easily say that he's saddened or disturbed by giving her a single portion. It's like, he's sad, you know. So here he is giving her a single portion. Meanwhile, he's given multiple portions to Panina. And that saddens his heart because here's his favorite wife who gets one, and Panina gets all these portions to share with all his kids. He loves his kids, don't get me wrong. But he's really wishing that Hannah had kids as well, as is Hannah. And especially when they go up here, because now the story tells us Panina gives Hannah all kinds of crap. She's just like all over her, you don't have kids. I don't know exactly how you tease somebody in Hebrew back in the day, but... Uh, she was really given her grief, and that just broke Hannah's heart. So she is weeping and sad, and Elkanah is telling her, Look, aren't I better for you than ten sons? Trying to cheer her up, but it ain't working. She's still sad because she knows I have a purpose in life. And what is that purpose? I really want to raise some kids. That's what's on my heart. I want to raise kids like all the other gals are raising kids. You know, that's what life was about back then. If you're a guy, you're going to go make a living. You're going to provide for your family. If you're a girl, you're going to raise kids. You're going to make a household. She only got a part of that. She could try and make the household and, and please Elkanah, make all the food and all this stuff. But she really felt something was lacking in not having children. In our next session, we're going to talk about that and how she remedied that situation through faith. And I hope that you'll join me for that. If you find these uh, little stories useful as we move forward, I hope you'll share them with friends. And meanwhile, uh, see you next time, I hope. K-A-0-K-A-O, signing off.